sector level. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, the time is now for question time, and I'll move first to Senator Rustin. Here, here. Ah, thank you, <clears throat> President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Minister, last week the Senate agreed, without dissent, to the Coalition's second reading amendment to the National Health Amendment Bill, requiring the listing of all medicines approved by the Pharmaceutical Benefit Advisory Committee on the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme. Is the government policy to list all medicines approved by the PBAC on the PBS? Minister Farrell. Um, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Rustin for uh, for her uh, question. Um, um, well, um, well, well, of course, um, we have seen uh, what the Liberals do when uh, they are in control of uh, the health uh, uh, the health budget, uh, and of course. Uh, We've seen what uh, Leader Dutton did when uh, he was. Uh... Uh, Senator Birmingham, wait to be called. Senator Birmingham. And a point of order on direct relevance. As you point out, interjections are generally, indeed, always disorderly, but you allow some degree of latitude. But what we outrageously have here is the Leader of the Government in the Senate responding to interjections that are really not interjections, they are prompts from the ministers uh, sitting Senator behind Birmingham. him. The Senator opposition, Birmingham. the coalition was silent Senator as Birmingham. the minister was answering. I'm going to ask you to draw into the question. Order. Senator Birmingham. Uh, order. I'm waiting. As Senator Birmingham, you got two feet. Please do the respect and listen to my response. Um, that is not a point of order, but I am going to remind the minister of the question, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. And uh, of course, it was the uh, Curtin and Chifley governments that took the first. Well, it's worth it's worth putting it in its historical uh, context uh, because I mean I, I won't repeat what I said earlier about uh, um, uh, Leader Dutton's uh, performance in this area, but it is worth pointing out that the Curtin and Chifley governments uh, took the first steps to make medicines affordable for uh, all Australians post uh, the Second uh, War. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. President, on a point of order in relation to relevance, um, I would ask you if you could reflect on the minister's answer so far to this question, which I believe has gone in mm -hmm. no way uh, to my question that was very specifically targeted to a vote in this chamber or an, an agreement in this chamber last week to say that all medicines that were approved by PBAC would be listed on the PBS. I'd ask you to draw the minister's uh, thank attention you, Senator to the Rustin, question. And, um, I'm sure you noted that I have already directed the minister to your question, and I will direct the minister again. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Thank, uh, <coughs> thank you, uh, uh, President. Um, uh, we're listing medicines, uh, and we're making them cheaper for all Australians. The government is committed to ensuring Australians have access to affordable medicines by listing medicines recommended by the Independent Pharmaceutical Benefits uh, Advisory Committee, the PBAC, on the Pharmaceutical Benefits uh, Scheme. The government, the government uh, has uh, delivered on our election promise to cut the cost of medications for millions and millions of Australians by reducing the PBS co-payment to a maximum of uh, 30 uh, per Minister script. Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Um, Chair or President, on a matter of, of relevance again, I have not asked about the co-payment for medicines. I clearly asked about the listing of PBAC approved medicines on the PBS. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Rustin. You did refer to the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, and I think the minister is being relevant. And I will listen carefully to the remainder of his question. Senator Rustin. Uh, the same point of order. They are two different things. Uh, thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister Farrell, please continue. Thank you, uh, President. Um, since the 1st of July 2022, the government has committed additional funding for 67 new and amended PBS listings. Um, a further 83 uh, items uh, were also approved. Thank with you, the Minister. Budget... The time for answering has expired. Senator Rustin, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, last week the Senate agreed without dissent to the Coalition's second reading amendment to the National Health Amendment Bill, which called on the government to urgently intervene to ensure FIAS remains permanently 
available on the PBS for the 15,000 Australians who rely on it beyond the six-month funding cliff. Considering this, when will the government announce to these 15,000 Australians that you have the, uh, that a permanent, ongoing and affordable access to FIASP on the PBS has been agreed to by the government? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, and I think I indicated when I was asked this question last week that, uh, I do, <coughs> being a diabetic myself, I do have uh, some familiarity with uh, the drugs uh, that uh, are uh, <coughs> on the, uh, the, the PBS uh, system. Um, and of course, the drug that you've just mentioned, uh, FIASP, FIASP uh, is a fast-acting insulin drug for, uh, for diabetes. Wow. Uh, Minister Butler's very important drug. <clears throat> Minister Butler's office uh, was made aware on the uh, 22nd of February 2023. Um, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Rustin. Oh, on relevance again, um, the question was very specific about the <coughs> agreement of this chamber for the medicine to be permanently listed ongoing. I'm just asking the minister, through you, Chair, if he could please advise when the 15,000 people who rely on this drug are going to be advised of the decision by this government to actually permanently list it. Having Thank a you, lecture. Senator Rustin. Um, I believe the minister is being relevant, and I will uh, listen to the remainder of his answer. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. And uh, I don't know why the opposition keeps asking me questions and then stops me from answering them. But let's see how we go. Minister Butler's office was made aware on the 22nd of February 2023 of no Novo Nordisk's intention to delist uh, the drug from the P PBS on the 1st of April 2023. The government appreciates the distress that a delisting— Thank you, Minister Farrell. Time for answering has expired. Second supplementary, Senator Rustin. Minister, last week the Senate agreed, without dissent, to the Coalition's second reading amendment to the National Health Amendment Bill, which called on the government to urgently list Trikafta on the PBS for children aged between 6 and 11 years old with cystic fibrosis, noting that PBAC recommended it be listed in November last year. Considering this, when will the government announce the listing to the 500 children aged between 6 and 11 with cystic fibrosis who will benefit from the affordable access of this life-changing medicine? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, you, uh, uh, thank you, President, and thank you, uh, Senator Rustin, for her, uh, her question. Um, uh, Trikafata is a drug used to treat uh, cystic uh, fibrosis. Uh, the government will expand the listening of that drug on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme for the treatment of uh, cystic uh, fibrosis in patients who are aged between 6 to 11 years as quickly as possible. The Department of Health and Aged Care is working— uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Um, could I just seek a point of clarification from the minister? Is he saying that it, the government hasn't agreed to do this? Is he actually saying that uh, the that's chamber— That's not a point of order, Senator Rustin. So the, order. the agreement of the chamber order. is Resume somehow being ignored. Seat. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. <clears throat> minister Farrell, please continue. Thank you, President. I'll repeat uh, my answer in case uh, Senator Rustin missed it. The government will expand the listing of the listing of the drug on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme for the treatment of cystic fibrosis in patients who are aged between 6 to 11 years as quickly as possible. The Department of Health and Aged Care is working with the company that produces that drug, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, to finalise all necessary listing requirements. Thank you, Minister Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Over the weekend, we saw another united Labor government elected in New South Wales. And yes, we are all pleased. It was clear, a clear message that the people of New South Wales want government to focus on the things that matter to them rather than focusing on internal party divisions and political point scoring. How will the Albanese government work with the New South Wales government to deliver meaningful outcomes for the people of New South uh, Wales? Senator Sheldon, and indeed, please resume your seat. Calling out across the chamber is incredibly disorderly, and not only that, it's disrespectful, because I've got a senator on his feet seeking to ask a legitimate question. Minister Sheldon, please continue. How will the Albanese government work with the New South Wales government to deliver meaningful outcomes for the people of New South Wales and, indeed, all of Australia? 
Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Uh, and can I congratulate, uh, on behalf of uh, the rest of your Senate colleagues, uh, Senator Sheldon, for the terrific work that you put in to the wonderful result on the weekend. And over the weekend, over the weekend, the people of New South Wales had their opportunity to have a say, and they spoke with a loud and clear voice as they voted for a fresh start under the terrific leadership of uh, Chris Minns and Labor. The people of New South Wales echoed the messages that we heard last year from the people of South Australia, uh, from the people of Victoria and for the people of Australia when they uh, voted for Labor governments. People voted for Labor governments because Labor governments are focused on tackling the issues that matter to Australian people. People voted for Labor governments who are focused on their needs as opposed to the internal party fights as those opposite continue to do. We welcome, we welcome, we welcome the Minns uh, Labor government. We will be working with the Minns government in the same way we work with all state and territory governments as we address the cost of living challenges people are facing as the result of a decade of Liberal and national neglect. We will support all state and territory governments to deliver support for Australians based on need as opposed to the colour-coded uh, spreadsheets that the former Liberal National Government relied on. And we will work with all state and territory governments uh, to make uh, Australians' uh, lives uh, better because that's exactly what Labor governments do. Thank you, Senator Labor. Farrell. Senator Sheldon, first supplement. Senator Watt, I've called you about four times. Senator Sheldon. Now, it's great to hear how the Albanese government will work with the Minns government to deliver meaningful outcomes for the people of New South Wales and, more broadly, Australia. Can the minister update the Senate on the measures the Albanese government has already taken to make Australia lives much better? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. As uh, Senator, uh, Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Thank uh, Senator Sheldon once again for his uh, very perceptive uh, question about uh, the links between uh, the new Minns government and the Albanese government. And of course, the Albanese Labor government has been delivering meaningful outcomes for Australians over the last 12 months. In just in just 10 months, uh, we've made childcare cheaper. We've made medicines cheaper. We've got an increase in the minimum wage. We've got a pay rise for aged care workers. We created 180,000 fee-free TAFE places. We've created 20,000 university places. We've expanded the Commonwealth Senior Card. We've extended paid parental leave. We supported regional first home buyers and we've repaired international relations. We've delivered so much that I can't list it all in just the minutes that I have in this answer. But Australians can Minister, rest assured— Minister, the time for answering has expired. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Thank you for the very informative response. Unfortunately, many of the Albanese policies which are designed to tackle the cost of living pressures and make Australians' lives better become the subject of political games in this place. What messages does the minister have for those who are putting internal party divisions and political point scoring ahead of delivering outcomes for Australians? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Thank uh, Senator Sheldon for his question. And I've, I've noticed this issue too, uh, Senator Sheldon. And sadly, many Liberal and National Party members and senators spend their time fighting within their own party. They spend their time seeking to score cheap political points. They spend their time looking for the latest social media video instead of looking at how they can help make Australians' lives better, like the uh, uh, Labor Party uh, does. I have a message to those opposite. Op opposite. Cheap political stunts don't help Australians with their cost of living challenges. They don't help put a roof over Australian families' heads, and they don't uh, make Australian lives better. It's clear from the results in New South Wales <coughs> this uh, weekend um, Australians' cheap political point scoring. I call on all of those opposite to stop the political games and work with this government to deliver meaningful change that benefits the Australian people. Thank you, Minister. Senator Canavan. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, look, my question is to my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. In reference to the Greens' deal with the Albanese Labor government on the safeguard mechanism announced today, Mr Adam Bant, the leader of the Greens Party, has said that the Beetaloo gas field will be required from day one to offset all of its emissions, scope one, scope two and scope three for domestic three. use. Will all co new coal and gas projects require their scope one, scope two and scope three emissions for domestic use to be offset from day one under the Albanese Labor government's deal with the Greens? Thank you, Senator Canavan. I remind you I'm the President. Uh, Minister Farrell. Yes, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thanks, uh, um, uh, Senator Canavan, for his uh, question. And of course, um, after a uh, wasted uh, decade, of course, uh, today is a very good day. Um, uh, we uh, we are legislating uh, for a. 43 per cent reduction, um, uh, and uh, today's uh, changes, of course, are how we're going to uh, deliver that. <coughs> uh, the safeguards will be a clear, stable and common sense framework for reducing uh, emissions. Um, <coughs> and the uh, only chance in this parliament uh, to reduce emissions of the biggest 215 uh, emitters in this uh, country. Um, and, uh, and we thank uh, businesses right across Australia um, and the, uh, particularly the Greens today for their constructive uh, dialogue. If, this, if, the opposition, if the opposition has got some concerns about this particular policy, then you could have... Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, again, a point of order on direct relevance. Now, Senator Farrell likes to go through the background part of a brief. These points of order actually give him time to be able to come to the specific question that was asked. So as he flicks through the pages in front of him, could we please draw him to Senator Canavan's very specific question about whether future projects will have their scope one, scope two and scope three emissions for domestic use have to be offset? Will uh, they you. or won't they? Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. Senator McKenzie. Senator um, Birmingham, I believe um, the minister is being relevant, but I will listen. Um, that question was very detailed. Yes, it had a direct ask at the end, but it was also very detailed. Minister Farrell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President. And, uh, uh, look, the reality, the reality is this, um, and at some point it must going to sort of strike the coalition that um, when you deal yourself out uh, of the— Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. Again, President direct relevance, the question went to a substantive matter of policy, not to whatever the minister wants to say about the opposition, but a substantive question of policy. Uh, Please you, draw Senator him Birmingham. to the policy. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I will certainly draw the minister to the question. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President. Look, the, re the reality is, at some point, you've got to understand, when you deal yourself out of uh, the Minister picture Farrell, by refusing Minister to negotiate. Farrell, please resume your seat, Senator Birmingham. President, you did just draw the minister to the question, and he is flaunting your ruling, ignoring your ruling, showing disregard. I urge you to please be proactive in reminding uh, him of that, or if need be, sitting him down if he continues to ignore uh, you. Senator Birmingham, I have drawn the minister to the question. I am. Senator McGrath, order. Um, Minister, I ask you to direct yourself to the. Um, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Conversations across the chamber are disorderly. I've called the minister to the question. I'm going to call the minister to answer the question. Minister. Thank you, President. And I completely reject the suggestion that I don't respect the chair because I do. Now, the safeguards uh, framework, framework will help deliver. The commitment of uh, Scope 1 emissions, uh, given the uh, cross-jurisdictional nature of uh, Scopes 2 and 3 emissions. Uh, the government uh, will refer Scope 2 and 3 emissions to the Energy and Climate Ministerial Council. Thank you, Minister. Senator Canavan, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, in his statement, Mr Adam Bant has said that the deal will stop 
many of the 116 Australian coal and gas projects that are in the pipeline for construction. Is this correct? Based on government analysis, how many projects will be stopped Senator and how Watt. many Australian jobs will this deal cost? Uh, thank you, Senator Canavan. Um, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Canavan for his, um, uh, his uh, first supplementary uh, question. Um, um, you've asked some questions about Mr Bant's um, uh, statements, then I suggest you go and ask him uh, about uh, what it was that he, uh, he intended to say. But as far as, as far as, as far as, uh, well, look, you keep asking me these questions. I start to answer them, and then you you try and stop me from answering. Well, Australia's oil and gas sector will continue to play an essential role in guaranteeing the energy security of Australia and our regions. Um, as we uh, know on this side, gas is a key enabler for Australia and our region's net zero transition. And I might, I might remind you, Senator Canavan, you used to have a policy of net zero by 2050. You may not have agreed to it, but that was the policy you took to the Australian people. Thank you, people. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Canavan, second supplementary. Not net zero in 2050, it's net zero today. Um, right now, 500 Australians have jobs helping to construct the Olive Downs mine near Moranbar in central Queensland. The mine will also provide 1,000 1, permanent operations jobs. Will this new mine have to offset all of its emissions from day one? Will any of these jobs be impacted by the Albanese Labor government's deal with the Greens? Thank you, Senator Canavan. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. And again, I um, reiterate: um, once once the coalition decides to deal themselves out of the debate, well, then <coughs> you can't complain when, in order to in order to implement the policies that we took to the uh, last uh, election, including our policy to get to uh, net uh, uh, net zero by 2050, which was also your policy, which was also your policy. Um, and of course, if you cared so much about these uh, places, of course, you, you, Senator Canavan, uh, would have pushed Farrell, your party your... and the Minister rest of the. Minister Farrell, Sorry. please resume your seat. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you. Just on a, on a point of order on, on relevance, um, the question was clearly about the 500 jobs, and those workers, Minister, deserve an answer to know if they have a job tonight. It's not thank a question you. that I'm asking. Uh, I'm asking on behalf of yes, them. I'm aware they of the deserve question. an answer, Minister. Do uh, they still have a Senator job Canavan. after they wake up tomorrow? Senator Canavan, resume your seat. I am going to remind senators that point order. Senator Canavan. Senator Canavan and Senator Ayres. I've just had you on your feet. Senator Canavan. Order across the chamber. Senator Watt. Order across the chamber. Senator Canavan. You've just been on your feet with a point of order. As I went to respond, you engaged with other senators in interjections across the chamber. That is disrespectful. I'm also going to remind senators in this place, if you jump on a point of order, make the point of order succinctly. Don't make points of debate at the end of it. Minister Farrell, I'll draw you back to the question. Thank you, uh, President. And uh, As you know, I'm a well-known um, supporter of uh, coal workers, as uh, was uh, very clear. The government supports scientific, uh, independent and evidence-based decision-making when it comes to the resources exploration and other commercial uh, developments. The coal industry gener generates more than uh, uh, $10 billion annually in royalties and provides Thank you, for Minister. over— Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Cox. Thank you. My question is for the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Minister Farrell. The government has updated the Thrive 2030 strategy to invest and increase the visitor economy in Australia. In this document, there's considerable mention of increasing First Nations tourism sector, which is welcomed. However, it's important that we invest in First Nations tourism, that we ensure that our cultural heritage is protected and First Nations people are beneficiaries of this investment, especially considering the recommendations of the Dukin report. My question is, how will Thrive 2030 protect First Nations cultural heritage as the First Nations tourism sector grows? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Farrell. Uh, 
Thanks, President, and I thank uh, Senator uh, Cox for her question. And I know, particularly based on uh, my uh, <coughs> frequent discussions with her, just how um, uh, how important this issue is to her, and uh, just how important um, getting uh, this part of our tourism sector right uh, is important to the country uh, generally. Um, as you say, uh, in the uh, revised uh, uh, Thrive 2030 project, which was relaunched uh, a couple of weeks ago in Sydney with all of uh, Australia's uh, trade uh, ministers, including, interestingly enough, both the, uh, the uh, um, Liberal trade minister and the incoming uh, Labor uh, trade minister, um, this government is, is all about... Um, uh, improving um, the lives of uh, Indigenous Australians in particular. And as you know, uh, we, uh, we're promoting uh, the recognition of ind Indigenous Australians for, through a voice to Parliament. <coughs> um, in, in, in a sense, everything else sort of flows um, from that uh, commitment because what it means is, uh, as a government, uh, we see not only the opportunity of improving the lives of Indigenous Australians through uh, greater uh, tourism uh, focused on, uh, in, on the Indigenous uh, experience, uh, but also uh, projecting to, to the world um, the commitment that this government has got uh, to, uh, to, in particular, Indigenous, uh, indigenous uh, issues. Um, in all of the uh, discussions that I have with um, <coughs> companies uh, overseas, we promote um, uh, Indigenous tourism as a unique aspect to the Australian uh, tourism experience. And uh, I'm, I'm extremely hopeful that, based on that, uh, that uh, revised uh, Thrive 2030, that we can build on what we're already doing in this space. Thank you, Minister. But the time for answering has expired. Senator Cox, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister Farrell. How does Thrive 2030 fit with the government's broader trade strategy and in particular creating economic, social, environmental and cultural opportunities through capacity building and investment uh, growth, um, particularly in relation to the ratification of the Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, which was uh, recommendation two of the Jukun report, which your government committed to. Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, President, and again thank uh, Senator Cox for her first supplementary uh, um, question. <coughs> um, the, 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 the focus of the government, of course, in terms of our trade strategy has uh, been one of diversification. We've, we've learnt from a bitter experience uh, that putting all of your eggs in one basket, whether it be tourism or trade or education, um, has some real downside risks when uh, that particular um, aspect of uh, the economy that you've devoted your resources to, um, there's a change of uh, economic circumstances uh, there. So um, by promoting Indigenous uh, tourism in this uh, country, by promoting the experience that uh, people overseas can, uh, uh, can get by engaging in that Indigenous uh, experience, we think that, that that's part of our overall diversification. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Cox, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister Farrell. How will this government, in the implementation of Thrive 2030, uphold Australia's obligations under, U under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, such as free prior and informed consent, and again, the ratification and the convention of the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage from 2003? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, Senator uh, Cox for her second supplementary question. I don't think you've uh, got a, a government in this country more committed uh, to um, raising and promoting the issues uh, of, uh, of Indigenous uh, tourism uh, in this country. And it's, it's not just because it's the right thing to do. There's actually an economic uh, advantage. Um, in the post-pandemic world, every country is trying to get some aspect of their tourism experience will, which will attract uh, tourists back to their, uh, to their country. Um, this um, offers a real opportunity uh, for Australia to have a unique offering uh, which will achieve all of the... Oh, sorry. Sorry, Senator Cox. Um... 
Senator Farrell was blocking my line of sight. The question was quite specific about the, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and free and prior informed consent. Now, I didn't once hear the minister refer to that. Uh, thank you, Senator Cox. Your uh, question also went to the 2030 matter um, and other matters. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. Uh, well, um, we are committed to um, all of our international ob obligations, but more particularly uh, later Minister this year— Minister Farrell, the time for answering has expired. Senator Mario Smith. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister please update the Senate about the impact of unfunded or terminating programs on budget deliberations and how the Albanese government has had to clean up the mess left by the Liberals and Nationals? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Smith. Uh, for her question, and yes, I can update the chamber on just the work we are doing to clean up the mess that's been left behind by the Liberals and Nationals when in government. We all knew that the former coalition government was addicted to spending taxpayers' money like it was Liberal Party money, and we heard uh, Senator Rennick uh, outline that in one of his contributions last week. The October budget also uncovered, if people remember, $4.1 billion of holes that we had to address in terminating measures, in funding cliffs and in zombie measures, some which had sat before the parliament till 2016, propping up the budget with a decision taken in 2016 and never moved upon. And we've had more time to go through the books. Order. The May budget would deal with more of the spending traps that the coalition deliberately baked into their bottom line, leaving the budget billions of dollars worse off. More funding cliffs for government programs, like no ongoing funding for my health record, no ongoing funding for public dental, uh, adult dental health, chronic underinvestment in the key cultural institutions that Australians treasure and are crumbling around us, literally crumbling around us. No funding for key commitments made by the former government. Remember the Olympics were 50-50, the Brisbane Olympics, but no provision made. No provision for the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Underfunding and erosion of capability in key public service agencies, meaning government can't deliver services like the Department of Agriculture and drop-offs in funding for the Australian Radioactive Waste Agency. Do you reckon we might need that after December? What about the National Emergency Management Agency? And what about the E-Safety Commissioner? Do you reckon they might need ongoing funding to keep their programs going? Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Marielle Smith, first supplementary. Hmm. Um, after coming to government, what has the minister discovered about the economic mismanagement of the coalition that confirms the electorate's distrust in the Liberals and Nationals? Uh, uh, Senator Smith, thank you. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, yes, I can. We've inherited a trillion dollars in debt and ongoing $50 billion in structural deficits with not enough to show for it. The former government spent money on rorts and waste to bolster their electoral chances with nothing to show for it. Our first budget in October uncovered those unlegislated zombie measures. Bank 6 2016 and not going to progress. Funding cliffs of programs which were ended purely to improve the forward estimates, even though any government would continue them. Failure to provision for necessary funding issues like COVID-19. And of course, let's remember their big save in their budget on robo debt. Remember when you pursued hundreds of thousands of Australians for debts they didn't owe to make sure your budget looked better than it was and it backfired against those, the lives of those Australians, Daniel. but also in the settlement you had to pay to get out of it. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, President. What measures is the Federal Labor government undertaking to dig the country out of the fiscal hole that the coalition created for ordinary Australians? And Our how minister. is the Albanese Labor government working to protect Australians from pressures related to the cost of living? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator Smith for her supplementary. Well, I think the Australian people know that the Albanese Labor government is one that can be trusted, both to be upfront with Australians about the state of their budget, 
We are cleaning up the mess and doing the job that the Liberals and Nationals refuse to do, funding the necessary services, funding the ongoing programs and addressing the spending shortfalls in key areas in the May budget. Unlike the Liberals and Nationals, our government will have the difficult conversations with the Australian people about the economic Senator challenges Hume. that we face and make the responsible decisions to Minister ensure a better future. Your seat. Senator Hume, I called you twice. I expect you to be silent. Thank you. Minister Gallagher, please continue. Uh, thank you. We're doing this work to ensure we can deliver for the Australian people, making room for targeted cost of living relief services that the Australian community expects. That, that's what Australians expect from their government, not a dodgy set of tricks and, and uh, booby traps hidden in the budget to make your bottom line look better all the while the thank Australian you, people suffer. The time for answering the question has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Last week, Senator, I asked questions about the funding for the Deposits Guarantee Scheme, which was designed to protect the money in the bank accounts of everyday Australians, capped at $250,000 per account, $20 billion per bank and $80 billion total. Minister, when the scheme was brought in, the eligible deposits being protected were $650 billion. According to Schedule 9 of Budget Paper 1 of the October 2022 Labor Budget, your budget, eligible deposits are now $1.2 trillion. Minister, how can $80 billion possibly protect $1.2 trillion in deposits? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And I think this question goes to some of the concerns that we're seeing in global uh, financial markets uh, at the moment, um, the impact on uh, some banks overseas and some concerns that um, Senator Roberts is raising about the potential for uh, impact here in Australia. And the answer is uh, the same as I gave last week. Uh, thank you, Senator Rennick. Would you like leave to speak to this question or am I allowed to? Oh, uh, you'd like to, would you? Minister Gallagher, sorry. Your comments to sorry, President. Order. I know responding Order. to I know responding Senator, to Senator Rennick, resume your seat. Tell us about your master's of applied science. I know Minister. responding to interjections are disorderly, but uh, Senator Rennick he, Senator Rennick's Order got verbal diarrhea, it seems, this question time. You can't keep it in. Um, and as I said last week, um, this is something the government is monitoring closely. In fact, the Treasurer uh, is being briefed twice a day on um, what's happening overseas and also being provided with feedback from regulators uh, and from the banking system here. Uh, and I think it is very good, and I would think that it's something that this Senate would, would um, welcome, is the fact that our financial markets, our system, our banking system, well regulated, well re uh, led, well capitalised, with good liquidity, we are not seeing uh, the issues that are being seen uh, overseas. Um, now, I did undertake, and I'm not sure if we've done this, to provide you with a written response to the question that you raised. Um, last week, uh, and I'll chase that if that hasn't got to you. Um, but also, if there is anything further I can provide in relation to the answer I've just given. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, first supplementary. Thank you. My constituents, as I expressed last week in the last question, was, are concerned. Minister, the protected amount is not indexed and would need to be increased to $380,000 per account and $115 billion overall, just to cover the same amount as the scheme did in 2008 because of inflation. Minister, will you increase the caps on the bank deposit guarantee to make up for inflation since 2008? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Well, in line with the, the answer I gave uh, last week, of course the government would respond in relation to concerns that were raised about the operation of our banking system uh, and the impact it was having here. We are not seeing that. Um, I think Australians should be reassured that the Australian banking system is resilient and all of our banks, as I said, are well capitalised, have strong liquidity coverage. Uh, the, Treasur Thank you. the Treasury and um, uh, regulators are closely monitoring the situation about potential impacts for Australia. And when I say that, very closely monitoring. Now, I can understand that people watching uh, what they've seen uh, with Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse and that would have 
race concerns. I can understand that. And the response is that since the GFC, uh, since the Banking Royal Commission, uh, we, there are uh, measures in place to ensure the strong performance of our banking system, and we don't have any concerns Thank about you, it. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Thank you. Reviewing the Minister's answers to my five questions on the guarantee so far. Firstly, the guarantee has not been adjusted for inflation, and so it offers 34 per cent less protection than when it was legislated. Secondly, the guarantee is not funded. There is no money available to implement it. Thirdly, the scheme only covers seven cents in the dollar of deposits. Fourth, the minister has refused to commit to activating the scheme if it was needed. Minister, can you explain why constituents should not conclude, as many have, that the bank deposits guarantee is a fraud, is a lie? Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Well, I don't agree with that representation by Senator Roberts uh, at all. Uh, and I have answered the question in a general sense by saying that if there were concerns, uh, as we saw in the GFC, then of course the government and I presume the parliament would act. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that at this point, we don't have concerns. We do not share the concerns. In fact, we've been given very strong reassurance by the regulators, by the banks themselves, by the systems that have been put in place by this place and the other place to ensure that we have a strong, well-regulated, well-capitalised banking system to, you know, to precisely um, you know, uh, insulate from some of the um, financial instability that we're seeing elsewhere. So yes, of course, the government would respond if we had to. At this point in time, uh, we are assured that it's not the case. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Minister, the presidents and other representatives from the Western Australian shires of Leonora and Laverton wrote to the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Albanese, earlier this year about the increase in alcohol-fueled violence that is ravaging their community, children not being fed, and the increasing violence against women, all following the abolition of the cashless debit card. Minister, my question, very sincere question to you is, have these reports been verified by the West Australian Police, and what information does the government have about the changes in crime rates across these communities? Thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Farrell. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator O'Sullivan, um, about uh, an important issue that uh, affects um, uh, his community in uh, in these uh, in these areas. Uh, let's call them the, the goldfields uh, uh, areas of uh, of Western Western Australia. I understand there have been um, some meetings um, between the uh, uh, Laverton uh, Shire and the uh, relevant. Uh, um, Albanese government uh, minister. I think there's been some discussions with uh, Mr. Patrick Hill, the president of the Shire of Leverton, uh, Mr. Peter Craig, um, <coughs> Shire of uh, Leonora, uh, Phil Marshall, um, chief executive officer of the Leverton Shire Council, Mr. Jack Carmody, Leverton Shire councillor, and Mr. Marty Sealander, chief executive of uh, uh, Pakanu. Um, and I understand those discussions um, and uh, other positive uh, discussions um, uh, have been about uh, what support services that uh, those uh, those uh, community leaders want to see um, in uh, in uh, in their community. Um, and uh, I understand uh, there's been a, a willingness uh, by the Shire to uh, reinstate the uh, the jobs uh, uh, hub. Um, there was, particularly in the in Laverton, I think there was um, some uncertainty about the uh, long-term uh, funding of the uh, Jobs Hub, um, because under the previous government, of course, um, it was going to run out in uh, in June. Um, so I think uh, there are some positive uh, signs there. Um, when it comes to the issue of uh, alcohol use uh, in remote Thank you, Minister. and the regional, the time for answering has expired, Senator. O'Sullivan, first supplementary. Reports published on the weekend indicate that the number of offences committed in Sojuna has doubled since the cashless debit card was abolished four months ago. Minister, given you didn't quite answer my last question about the police, uh, I'd ask you in relation to South Australia: Have the, 
these reports been verified by the South Australian Police, and what information does the government have about changes in crime weights across the Sejuna community? Uh, thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Farrell. Uh, thanks, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, uh, Senator O'Sullivan for his question about um, Sejuna. Um, I think the most recent uh, reports that the minister has uh, received um, from her department indicate that there's been a decline uh, in admissions and presentations due to alcohol uh, and drugs uh, or injuries in Sejuna. Um, stakeholders, uh, well, I'm just telling you, <coughs> telling, I'm, I'm just telling you, I mean, you asked the question. You ask the question. I'm giving you a direct answer to the question. You may not like the answer, but with respect, Senator Rustin, you're no longer in charge of this, uh, of this uh, area. You're no longer in charge of this area. We've got a terrific minister in the, in the person of uh, Amanda Rishworth, who I know takes a very particular interest in uh, issues uh, in, uh, in Sejuna, Thank you, as she the does. The time for answering has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Months later, why hasn't the Prime Minister responded to the correspondence from the representatives of affected Western Australian communities? And when will he visit any of the negatively impacted communities? Uh, thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Farrell. Well, as I recollect, <coughs> one of your complaints was that the Prime Minister didn't go to uh, Alice Springs when they were having uh, um, a, a range of uh, issues there. And my recollection is I saw <coughs> um, uh, the Prime Minister and, uh, and Minister uh, Bernie both uh, um, attending uh, up uh, up in Alice Springs. And uh, I do note, I do, I do, I do note, I do note that uh, in the. I, I do note. I do Order. note. Order, Minister Farrell, please continue. Thank you. Um, I do. I do note that uh, the Prime Minister has been to. I, I do note. I, knew, I do note. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath and Senator Watt, calling out across the chamber, chamber constantly is disorderly. The minister is on his feet answering a question. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Um, I, do, I do know that uh, the Prime Minister, I think I'm right about this, has either been to Western Australia nine or ten times since becoming uh, uh, the Prime Minister of, uh, of this country, which is, which is a lot more, lot more than in the previous Thank 12 months. Thank you, Minister. Month. The time for answering has expired. Senator Faruqi. President. My question without notice is to Minister Farrell, representing the Minister for Housing. Minister, reports last week revealed Australia is one of the worst places in the developed world to be a renter. Rents are a staggering 22 per cent higher than they were in 2020, and renters in Australia are projected to pay $10 billion in rent increases this year alone. More people than ever are living in cars, caravans and tents. More and more people are struggling to pay rent and having to make the choice between rent and food, between rent and medication, between rent and childcare fees. Will the government finally do the same thing they did for energy caps and coordinate a national freeze on rent increases and coordinate national tenancy standards? Thank you, Senator Faruqi, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, President, and thank uh, Senator for, uh, Faruqi for her uh, question. And uh, I know her sincere um, concern uh, about the uh, plight of renters uh, in this uh, country, which, which the Albanese government uh, um, shares with, uh, with you. And uh, of course, um, this government has been coming um, to the, the parliament with um, solutions to um, the difficult issue of, uh, of housing in this, uh, in this country. We know that a lot of people across Australia are struggling right now uh, to, to uh, find a, an affordable place to rent. Uh, we hear their concerns and we hear your concerns, uh, uh, Senator uh, Faruqi, uh, and we are acting to address them. The answer to rental stress is a sustained booth, boost in the supply of homes to rent. 
and a substantial investment in new social and affordable houses. And that's uh, what this government um, is, uh, is aiming uh, to do, Senator Faruqi. Um, the government uh, struck a national housing accord between all levels of government, investors uh, and industry to build the affordable homes our country desperately needs uh, to boost the supply of new houses. In addition to the accord, we've now passed legislation for the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund through the House of Representatives, although I note not yet the, uh, the Senate. Our ambitious uh, reform agenda to deliver more social and affordable homes uh, right across uh, the country includes the widening of the uh, National Housing Infrastructure Facility with up to $575 million available to invest in more social Thank and you, affordable- Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. Minister, the government is cutting funding for 27,000 affordable national renter affordability scheme homes while proposing a fund that gambles $10 billion on the stock market, which doesn't guarantee a cent to be spent on housing, and last year would have lost $120 million. Do you accept that currently the government's housing plan will make the crisis worse for renters? Thank you, Senator Fruki. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, pr President. Uh, well, I, no, I don't. Uh, th I thank uh, <coughs> Senator Faruqi for her uh, first supplementary question. Um, no, I don't accept that uh, pr proposition, uh, Senator Faruqi. Um, for instance, the regional first home buyer guarantee uh, was uh, brought forward by three months by this government. Uh, and more than 2,000 places have already been taken up, with hundreds of Australian families now in their uh, new homes. With Help to Buy, a new program to help Australians get their uh, own home sooner. Uh, establishing uh, a permanent uh, National Housing Supply and Affordability Council. Uh, the Interim Council has been operating since the 1st of January of this year and it uh, provides uh, independent expert advice to government, but particularly developing a new national housing and homelessness plan. Um, the government has been talking Thank with you, state Minister, and the territory time for housing. has expired. Senator Green. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Faruqi. Please, uh, second supplementary. Minister, the government's own National Housing Investment Corporation has reported that Australia needs at least $15 billion a year in investment in public community and affordable housing. How does the government justify proposing to spend $368 billion on nuclear attack submarines and only a maximum of $500 million on housing? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, Senator Faruqi for her um, uh, second supplementary question. I think you're, with due respect, uh, Senator uh, Faruqi, I think you're conflating two separate issues. Um, one of the obligations, like it or not, that uh, federal government have uh, is to ensure the uh, defence and security uh, of Australia, and uh, the Albanese <laughs> government takes that issue seriously. And that's why we've uh, made some announcements in the last couple of weeks in terms of defence. Um, we are bringing to this parliament a very significant reform package uh, in terms of uh, housing, which will, we believe, uh, assist uh, both people getting into their own homes, but more particularly renters, ensuring that they uh, have an opportunity to rent and there's downward pressure on those rents. Can I say this? That project uh, of this government was much more likely to succeed. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Green. <clears throat> Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and the Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Watt. Uh, can the Minister explain why funding certainty is important for essential government functions like emergency management and national security? And what happens when governments don't plan for the future by providing that certainty? Thank you. Senator Green, Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you very much, Senator Green. As a Cairns-based senator, I know you've provided a lot of support to regional communities experiencing floods uh, and other disasters in your time here. Uh, in the 10 months that I've been Minister for Emergency Management, I've obviously seen a lot of floods. 
Every time I visit a different flood or storm impacted community, I hear the same stories over and over again. People keep saying it's always flooded in the past, but never like this. Or they say this exceeds anything we've ever seen before, or this isn't normal. And this pattern was evident all the way back in 2019 with the Black Summer bushfires, when we saw unprecedented fires in Queensland rainforests, when we saw the entirety of Kangaroo Island under a bushfire warning, and when we saw fires across New South Wales and Victoria burn for months. It's been blatantly obvious for a very long time that long-term investment in disaster funding and taking action on climate change has been required. And while those of us on this side of the chamber have acknowledged the impacts of climate change for some years, those opposite are still living in the dark ages. These ideological beliefs and climate wars have hamstrung their ability to prepare for natural disasters. The fact is that for nearly a decade, the coalition failed to make our country more resilient to the impacts of natural disasters. And despite all the evidence over all those years, they seemed to think that the disasters would stop. In fact, they even came up with a precise date that they thought the natural disasters would stop, and that was the 30th of June this year. Now, I say that because it's, the, it's that date that nearly 25 per cent of the funding for our national disaster agencies runs out. That's right. The former government under Senator Birmingham and Senator Mackenzie didn't fund their national natural disaster agencies past the end of this financial year. According to the forward estimates, if the coalition had won the election, our national you, disaster Senator agencies could not have continued operating. Senator Green, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, how is this funding uncertainty impacting on the Commonwealth's ability to support states and territories in responding to the increasing number of natural hazards? Thank you, Senator Green. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Thank you again, Senator Green. Now, let me repeat that. Under the former government, 25 per cent of the funding for our national disaster agencies runs out on the 30th of June this year. So despite all of the floods, all of the bushfires, all of the cyclones, they just said it's going to be OK, it's going to stop raining on the 30th of June 2023, and we won't need that funding beyond that. Now, what does that funding uncertainty mean? Well, what it means, if it's not fixed by our government, is that a network of, our network of recovery support officers around the country uh, is impaired, along with our ability to provide payments to disaster-impacted communities and any national planning to build nation, national resilience. They're the things that would have occurred had the coalition won the last election. As I say, it's almost as if the coalition thought that these events would just stop and that everything would be fine, the sun would come out, we'd get precisely the right, right, right amount of rainfall in precisely the right area Areas, and we'd never have to worry about natural disasters. This is the economic Thank vandalism you, Minister, we've inherited and we're fixing up the mess. Expired. Senator Green, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, how could former governments have better prepared for the increasing number and intensity of natural hazards? Thank you, Senator Green, Minister. Thank you, Senator Green. Well, maybe as a starting point, the former government, when it was pre preparing its budget just before the election, could have thought, well, you know, we've been having a lot of floods lately, we've been having a few bushfires lately, a few cyclones. Maybe we need to make sure that our National Natural Disaster Agency has the funding to continue its operations. But no. Their budget, Senator Birmingham's budget, Senator Mackenzie's budget for the Emergency Management Department, actually was going to cut 25 per cent of the funding for that agency from the 30th of June this year. Since our election 10 months ago, the Albanese government has shown that no matter what state or territory you live in, when a natural disaster strikes, we will be there with you and we will provide the funding that is needed to respond properly to natural disasters. And that's why we've been fixing the neglect of the past decade. We're overhauling the Emergency Response Fund, the $5 billion fund that never built a single project with our Disaster Ready Fund. We're overhauling disaster funding arrangements. We are fixing the mess that we have been left in so many portfolios including Thank disaster you, Minister, management. The time for answering has expired. Senator Scarf. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Is it correct that the Keating government released the Solicitor General's advice provided to the then government's advisory committee ahead of the referendum to establish an Australian Republic? Is it also correct that the Gillard government released the Solicitor General's advice in relation to border protection policies? Thank you, Senator Scarf. As Minister Farrell. Um, 
Look, I don't know the answer to either of those questions, uh, um, but uh, I'm uh, very happy to uh, make some inquiries and find out what the answer to those two questions are. Uh, thank you, Minister Far uh, uh, Senator Scar. Senator Scar, first supplementary. Hmm. Well, Senator Farrell, I can, I can uh, save you the work and say it did. Uh, and given these precedents, including the um, provision— Just a moment, uh, Senator Scar. Uh, um, uh, the senator knows the answer to the question. Why? What's um, the point senator, of asking me the senator, question? Minister Farrell, that is not a point of order. Senator Scar. Given these precedents, including the provision of Solicitor General's advice for the last proposed referendum yes. to change the Australian Constitution, will the Albanese Labor government make the Solicitor General's advice relating to its proposed constitutional amendment available to the Australian public and the Parliamentary Select Committee that it proposes to establish? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Farrell. Um, my understanding um, uh, is that uh, uh, the Attorney General is not proposing to make that uh, advice uh, public. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator Scar, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. On what public interest ground? On what public interest ground is the Albanese Labor government refusing to release the Solicitor General's advice relating to its proposed constitutional amendment prior to Australians having to cast their votes on it? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Carr for the second supplementary question. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, ask the uh, Attorney uh, General uh, to come back with an answer on that question. Thank you, Senator Farrell. <coughs> Senator Farrell. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. You are too slow. <laughs> Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting President. I rise to take note on all questions from opposition senators to ministers today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr President. Well, well today uh, there were a lot of questions, a lot of important questions asked of the government on a, on a day where they've announced a huge deal with the uh, Greens Party to establish a massive new carbon tax on job-creating projects in this country. But unfortunately, uh, unfortunately there were no answers uh, given. Uh, about these very important questions. Uh, uh, this deal, this dodgy deal that's been done between the Labor and the Greens, potentially means that all new coal and gas and, and other mining projects will require to have all of their emissions offset. What that means is they'll have to buy carbon credits for all of the emissions uh, that they did. Previously, previously, the government announced that they only have to buy offsets for the amount of emissions they're reducing, 5 per cent a year. Now it'll be not 5 per cent next year, it'll be 100 percent for these projects next year. Now there is a mine, there's a new mine being built in my area in central Queensland near Moranbar, the Olive Downs mine. I asked about that particular mine and uh, the minister couldn't even tell the 500 people that are working there tonight. They'll be going to sleep in a camp away from their families tonight. And the leader of the Labor Party in this Senate couldn't tell 500 Australian workers whether they have a job tonight. They claim that they're the party representing workers. They claim they represent the people that go to work for, uh, to help this country be strong, and they can't even give them basic answers. They haven't done basic analysis. Maybe the people responding to this take note could, can provide these answers to workers in this country. Can they provide them answers? Will they have to? Will this mine, this Olive Downs mine, have to offset 100 per cent of its emissions? And if it has, what analysis, what consultation have they done with the mine to know whether those people will have or lose their jobs overnight? What, what have they done? Because, according to Mr Bant, according to the Leader of the Australian Greens, who seems to be in charge in this place right now, according to Mr Bant, uh, yeah, and it's been confirmed, he's in charge. He's in charge of the government. No one, hardly anyone voted for Mr Bant in this country, uh, but he's in charge. He's in charge of this place. He says, he's giving more detail than the Labor government at the moment, but he says that the Beetaloo gas field, one of these projects, will be required from day one to offset all of its emissions, scope one, scope two and scope three for domestic use. I just want to pick particularly 
remind people what that last bit means. Scope 3 for domestic use. Scope 3 emissions are the use of the gas. So when you use the gas or the coal and you burn it to create energy and electricity, which still more than half the world's energy comes from those sources, that's scope 3 emissions. So the deal that the Labor Party have done with the Greens would tax, would penalise the use of coal and gas in Australia for domestic use. That's what Mr Ban said, for domestic use. If you send the coal and gas over to Japan and Korea, they're tax-free. <laughs> or China? China, tax-free. How absurd is this? that we're going to penalise the use of our own energy for our own purposes, but not other countries. Not other countries. Well, this deal that's been announced between the Labor and the Greens today, it's a bit like the Game of Thrones. It's a bit like Game of Thrones. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. And it's going to be, unfortunately, if this deal goes through this place, it's going to be a long, cold, dark winter, many winters uh, for those to come in this country, because we're not going to have enough energy for our own use. They're not going to be the gas projects, the coal projects we need to keep the lights in this country. We know, and the government knows from the Australian energy market operator, that we are facing massive gas shortages in the next few years. We have a huge problem that the Bass Strait is declining as an oil and gas producing field. We need to replace it with new projects like Narrabri in New South Wales, like hopefully the Beetaloo in the Northern Territory. The Greens want to stop it, we know that. But they, they are going to mean that people have to pay massive amounts for their power. If you, thought, if you think your power bill is bad now, wait, wait until we stop all new coal and gas projects in this country. We still need coal and gas for more than 70 per cent of our electricity needs. Wait till we stop all those and then, and then see uh, what real pain looks like in your power prices. prices. We'll be paying what they are in the UK and Europe and Germany before you know it. And that will hurt poor people in this nation. And the Australian Labor Party here is an absolute embarrassment that they cannot answer uh, questions right now about the impact of these policies, because, because these, policies, these policies will mean that there are more than a million Australians that rely on the mining sector for their jobs now face uncertainty. And keep in mind, it's not just coal and gas. Lithium mines, nickel mines, copper mines, they're all, they're all captured by the safeguard mechanism too. They use a lot of diesel. Uh, Senator, Senator Stirl knows this. They don't have a lot of electricity in some of these parts of Australia. They have to use diesel, and they're in capture. And so why would we put restraints on mining the very resources we need to have batteries, wind turbines and all these other stuff? How stupid are we? They're going to they're put a massive constraint, basically a stop, a big stop sign, to nickel mines, to lithium mines, the stuff that they think they need, uh, they claim they want to power the, the world. This is going to be an absolute disaster for this country and every power price rise, every blackout is on the heads of the Greens and Labor parties that are in charge in this place. Senator Stirl. I clarify the record before I respond. So in her first question to Minister Farrell, Senator Rustin stated, and I quote, last week the Senator agreed without dissent to the Coalition's second reading amendment to the National Health Amendment Bill requiring the listing of all medicines approved by the Pharmaceutical Benefit Advisory Committee on the Pharmaceutical Benefit Schemes, unquote. This is a mischaracterisation, Mr Deputy President, of the government's position. Whilst we did not call a division, the government did not support the second reading amendment for the reasons Senator McCarthy outlined in her summing up speech when she stated, and I quote, there are long-standing considered processes for PBS listings through PBAC, not second reading amendments." Unquote. Now, Mr Deputy President, I'd like to touch on the question that was asked of Senator O'Sullivan to Minister Farrell and about the cashless welfare card. Now, it is an extraordinarily well known in this chamber and outside of this chamber. I am a loyal member of the Australian Labor Party, but I had a bit of a different view on the abolition of the wealth, cashless welfare card. I believe that it was not the silver bullet. I honestly believe we could do a lot better. But I made it very clear here in this building on a number of occasions talking to my mates, uh, the Aboriginal leaders in the Kimberley, that there were mixed views. I also remember the, the, uh, the uh, passionate arguments when it first started, not in Leonora and Lowden and Kalgoorlie, but certainly up in Kununurra and then into Wyndham. And I remember the leadership in Kununurra of the Indigenous uh, um, uh, corporations and communities up there, my very dear friend Ian Trust, 
Lawford Benning, Teddy Carlton, and I remember the passion in the speeches because as they had made it very clearly to me what was happening up in the Kimberley, I'm only talking about the Kimberley, I know it happens all over Australia, it was not unique to just Aboriginal communities, but they were sick of seeing their children being buried, they were sick of seeing their, their, their population, their people being buried way too early, and they wanted change, they wanted something different. Unfortunately, the card didn't deliver what was hoped it would deliver. It split the community. There's no argument about that. But I do want to say this. I think it's disingenuous that a lot of us sitting here in Canberra, uh, and I, this is not a slight on Senator O'Sullivan, because Senator O'Sullivan works very hard up in the Kimberley, like I do. Senator O'Sullivan and I are both co-chairs of the Gurama Yani Yu, the, the uh, men's uh, um, uh, shed in Fitzroy Crossing, and I know Senator O'Sullivan's commitment to Indigenous advancement in his previous life working for Mindaroo. But I must say this, Mr Deputy President, I have worked in Indigenous communities in the Kimberley longer than any other senator in this building. And I'm not saying that I've got all the answers. I don't. But one thing I take dearly as I wander through the Kimberley, not only in my role as a senator but in my role that I provide pre-loved furniture to communities in Fitzroy Crossing, to, fit, to, to supply bedding through Fitzroy Crossing, to supply this is all donated stuff, road trains are the stuff, where my mates in the trucking industry throw a prime mover at me, three trailers, two dollies, and I run all that pre-loved furniture up to the Kimberley in Fitzroy and in Kununurra to help service uh, those in remote communities through Kununurra, Wyndham, Warm and Halls Creek. We've even had people coming from Balgo to uh, get hold of this second-hand furniture very, very cheap, and we create the opportunity for Indigenous people to get training and employment throughout the Fitzroy Valley and through the East Kimberley. But it really does point to one thing, and I must say this. I cannot stress through all my tours, through all my meetings, through all my conversations in the Kimberley for the last 30 odd years as a truck driver, longer, 40 years as a truck driver and also as a senator, that there is one thing that Aboriginal leaders say to me, whether they're male, whether they're female, whether I'm talking to the, the Women's Resource Centre or whether I'm talking to training and employment service providers or I'm talking to health providers or those in the justice system. My Indigenous leaders and my Indigenous friends throughout the Kimberley make it very, very clear to me. When I go there, they say one thing to me. There is one common denominator. And they say, Glenn, when is someone going to listen to us? When is someone in Canberra or in government actually going to ask us what we want? I cannot think of a more powerful reason to stand up and support the referendum to deliver the voice so Indigenous people can actually have their say and they can actually be listened to. I cannot wait for the referendum. And I applaud everyone in the Aboriginal communities that I work and represent. I will be there alongside you, for you and with you. Senator Bragg. Deputy President, and no right to take note of the answers as well given today. Um, and, uh, I take the point Senator Steele makes about uh, the, this issue. I think it's, fair, it's a fair point that uh, we haven't done a very good job of listening to people when we've sought to make policy uh, in this country over the last 250 years. And there are a range of views on how this should be done. And when you travel into remote parts of uh, the states we represent, uh, you'll get a range of views about uh, how that could be improved. And I think people do want to see new institutions. And I think that is the best argument for the voice, that there should be new institutions to help communities make decisions uh, about their own affairs and their own arrangements. And that has always been my view. And we're now at a point in time where uh, there is going to be a referendum. And I think we need to give people comfort that this can be done in a way that is going to preserve the institutions that have otherwise served the country well. Because, of course, you wouldn't seek to introduce new institutions if you thought they were all working well. And I think the average, uh, I think the, the reasonable view here would be that Australia has been a very good country, uh, but it, is, it has too often let Indigenous people down, chiefly because of this uh, terrible problem of paternalism. And uh, that is what the, these. Uh, these initiatives are about. And so uh, as someone that wants to recommend a yes vote, 
Uh, I would like to understand exactly what the advice is. I think that's a reasonable proposition. And uh, I'm not seeking to make any political points here other than uh, we want to make sure that this is a safe change for our constitution. Uh, I, I think it is a reasonable point uh, that there could be cases where the voice as a new institution or as a institution that's been running for some time uh, would seek uh, uh, legal remedies through the High Court. That, that may be reasonable from time to time. But the point here is we wouldn't want to see a situation where things were extraneous to the core function. And that is the question for me, is uh, are the words that were released last week good enough to ensure that the voice is going to be effective, um, it is going to have all the power it needs, but it isn't going to bung up the system of government we have and bind up the courts. Now, that's, that's the question. Now, um, there may be good reasons why it can't be released, I don't know. Uh, it appears to be the case that there are conventions here or there have been precedents where advice has been released in connection with referenda. Uh, but if there is a good reason, then I look forward to understanding that when we hit, hit the committee stage of this process, because I understand that there is to be a joint committee of the parliament which will look at this bill, this constitution alteration bill. That's what we're talking about at the moment. And uh, that will be the opportunity to ask the department in the hearings uh, about this wording. Now, if, if the advice isn't going to be provided through the usual way, then I'm sure that the committee uh, can find a way to get a sense of what the department's view is, but also the, the various legal minds. And there are many former High Court justices and other legal people with much bigger brains than mine uh, that are offering their view on this wording. And people will have to make a decision about whether they are prepared to support or oppose something uh, based on the legal interpretation of various people. And these people will be in the department, there'll be the retired judges, there'll be people who are working in the law today, and we will all have an opportunity to hear from uh, those various minds. And I look forward to doing that and then uh, landing a position. But I would say, and I'd just, just, repeat myself again, uh, that I don't think this is a good place to play politics, but I, I do think it would help if we could have the advice, or at least some sanitised version of the advice, so that we could be more satisfied that these changes that were made last week um, are going to be satisfactory. Because I personally have an open mind about these changes, but I don't understand the genesis behind these, uh, frankly, uh, new changes uh, made last week. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, there's one thing that my good friend Senator Bragg and I agree with, and that is that the previous government could have done better. And they had 10 years, in or almost 10 years, in government, um, and we saw what the outcome was. And, you know, if laughter is medicine, then the track record of those, in gov those opposite in government must be curing the world, don't we think? Um, I would like to take note on what uh, Senator, Canavan, um, Senator Canavan's question was to um, the minister. And he said, winter is coming. Well, Senator Canavan, winter may be coming, but the Albanese government is manning the walls whilst your party is bickering on who will sit on that throne. You know, we saw in the election just over the weekend, and if anyone missed out, let me just remind you that those opposite lost in New South Wales. They, you suspended your whip in Victoria and you don't exist in WA, but also you don't participate here. So it's just one way of Australians saying that they've had enough. They really have had enough of your decade of delay, denial and destruction, and they want to see action. And you sit there asking us, what are we doing? What are we doing for workers? 
What are we doing for Australians out there who are doing it tough? What are we doing with the housing crisis? What are we doing with climate change? Well, let me just tell you that with the announcement today, Australia is one step closer to achieving net zero by 2050, with confirmation that, there's, that we've secured additional parliamentary support for the safeguard mechanisms reforms. Now, these are overdue, sensible reforms which ensures Australia's largest emitters are competitive in a decarbonising global economy and that they're doing their fair share. They're making their fair contribution in ensuring that we reach that reduction target. Now, those opposites have, of course, made themselves irrelevant despite calls across industry for bipartisan support for these reforms. You know, these reforms are, you, are the chance, our first chance in over a decade to implement transformative climate change action that gets us towards net zero and has broad support across economy and community. You know, we've had extensive consultation with business groups, with industries, with community groups. And this is what they've been crying out for way too long. It has been carefully designed. These reforms have been carefully designed to cut pollution in our biggest industrial emitters while minimising costs and allowing flexibility at at least cost abatement opportunities to be deployed. Now, the Albanese Labor government recognises that Australians and Australian industries out there are smart. They'll choose the least cost abatement, and these reforms allow them to do that. Now, unless the parliament passes government safeguard reforms, Australia's 2030 emissions reduction projections will be 35 per cent, not 43 per cent as we legislated. So no MP or senator can criticise this government about emissions reductions targets and say that they're not good enough if they then come into parliament and vote against policies to achieve emissions reductions. Now, it's important to understand that there are sensible and prudent buffers in the scheme which take into account the possibility of new entrants. You know, we've been hearing from those opposite who I think are probably suffering from delusions of adequacy. They think that, you know, they've done so well in the last decade and we're not doing enough in the last 10 months. But I'd like to highlight and remind you who the Australian people trusted and put in government. Who elected us to be the adults in charge to fix the mess that your government put us in? You know, we know ScoMo doesn't hold a hose, but can any of you hold a hammer to fix this mess? Senator Little. Thank you, Deputy President. We know that ensuring continued and improved access to affordable medicines is now more important than ever, with the cost of living continuing to put significant and rising pressure on all Australians. It was great to see the government pass the Coalition's amendment to their National Health Amendment Bill last week, which noted the Coalition's strong record on affordable medicines and called on them to intervene in the remo removal of FIASP on the PBS to urgently list Trifafta for children and cystic, with cystic fibrosis and to commit to listing all medicines on the PBS that have been recommended by PBAC. It is important to acknowledge the importance of the government continuing the former coalition government's record on the PBS, which has ensured affordable access to critical medicines for all Australians. The coalition is proud of the fact that in government, it listed almost 3,000 new or amended medicines on the PBS. This represented an average of around 30 listings or amendments per month, or one each day, at an overall investment of nearly 15 billion. That's a lot of people helped to get greater access to medicine. 
However, we remain concerned by Labor's record on affordable medicines, noting that they had to stop listing new medicines when they were last in government because they couldn't manage the money. We know that Labor went to the election with a promise of cheaper medicines, but it seems they have already broken this promise because they have decided to remove a life-changing diabetes drug from the PBS FIASP, which is being relied on by 15,000 Australians who suffer from type 1 diabetes. The coalition government listed this very important diabetic medicine on the PBS in 2019. The coalition understood that FIASP is an innovative mealtime insulin that improves sugar blood levels at a faster rate than other diabetes medications, resulting in improved quality of life for the people who take it. But Labor, in the middle of a cost of living crisis, has made the decision to remove affordable access to a life-changing drug that's been relied on by 15,000 Australians with diabetes. The most concerning part is that we know that Minister Butler, as the Minister for Health, has the ability to intervene, but so far he has chosen not to. Ministerial discretion to ensure critical medicines like FIASP can, can remain commercially viable on the PBS and therefore affordable to the Australians who rely on them. Minister Butler must explain to the 15,000 Australians with diabetes who rely on FIASP why he is refusing to exercise that discretion to solve this issue. To add further concern, in November last year, the PBAC recommended that the innovative drug, drug Trifactor, be added to the PBS for treatment to the children with cystic fibrosis aged 6 to 11 years. However, government has so far failed to add this life-changing medicine to the PBS, despite the months that have passed since it was recommended. Under the coalition, we listed every medicine on the PBS that was recommended by PBAC, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. The government must do the right thing by the 500 children with cystic fibrosis who would benefit from affordable access to this life-changing medicine and list this medicine on the PBS. Time and again, they continue to prove that they are all talk and no action. There is no more critical a time to ensure affordable access to medicines than right now with the cost of living skyrocketing under this government. Labor continues to prove that they will say one thing to get elected and then turn around and do the opposite when in government. Their broken promises are adding up. They promised cheaper mortgages. That hasn't happened. Lower inflation, we've seen that go up. And real wage increases, mm -mm. But to borrow their phrase, right now, Everything is going up except for wages. I, just excuse me, Senator Cox, I have to put the question, and I think you're going to take note of something else. I'll put the question, those for the question say aye against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Cox. Thank you. I rise to take note of the answers given by Minister Farrell about uh, Thrive 2030. Now, I want to thank the Minister for giving some of the answers that I asked uh, of my questions, and I'm pleased to see the government are taking uh, the opportunity to invest in the tourism sector seriously, both after the disruptions of COVID-19, but also bushfires and floods that we've seen across the country, which in fact has hit the tourism industry quite hard. We are slowly seeing uh, recovery in some aspects and borders are opening and starting to welcome people uh, both domestically but also internationally here to Australia. And it's a perfect time for this government to invest in a sector um, which is essentially what uh, Thrive 2030 is about. Um, as highlighted by the minister, there is an and, and indeed the reason for this question, the reason I asked it, is that this strategy relies heavily on First Nations tourism. And First Nations people have experiences that cannot be held anywhere else. And he referenced the unique aspects, aspects of First Nations culture. But in order for us to do that, in both investing in First Nations tourism and also empowering First Nations people to share both culture and stories with tourists, it's critical that we ensure that First Nations people are 
both the owners of that uh, information, they operate their own ventures, uh, they have control over what can be shared, where they can take people, what's sacred and what, what, they can, what, what they can provide in that experience to people because it, not everything is appropriate to be shared and particularly um, around culture. And it's only First Nations people that know this information. So it's important when we talk about the aspect of cultural heritage protection, it has to be legislated and it has to be legislated in a way that we can protect it. Now, cultural heritage is at the heart of any First Nations or First Peoples uh, tourism industry. And it relies on sacred sites, it relies on song lines, dance, song, art, bush foods, botanicals, medicine, um, and other practices which are appropriate to share. But it doesn't allow anybody to culturally appropriate that. And if we don't legislate it, if we don't put it in our trade negotiations and we fail to include it, um, it just becomes words on a paper. It becomes the strategy that everyone goes to Sydney and all the ministers have a lovely little gathering and stand up and say how wonderful this is. It doesn't actually protect cultural heritage on the basis of creating a thriving tourism industry that empowers First Nations community, but is also for the health and wellbeing, the connection to country that this provides. And we need a good legislative framework in order to do that. Now, in First Nations communities, we don't see ourselves as separate to nature. So this is why um, you know, last week I was at the World's Indigenous Tourism Conference, so the week before, talking to people globally about the experience of sustainable tourism and how we can ensure that we are providing both economic, environmental, social and cultural factors into protecting our cultural heritage so that the experience of Jook and Gorge, 40,000-year-old rock shelters in the Pilbara, in my home state, the destruction of those was at the forefront of people's minds. Because internationally, there were headlines about how tragic this was, how the system failed at all levels to protect First Nations cultural heritage in this country. And we have a committee report, and I, I had the... Um, opportunity to sit on this committee and the report um, was basically what I asked Minister Farrell about. How, when, when are we going to see those minimum standards included in legislation and good regulatory frameworks that allow cultural heritage to be protected in this country? Because without cultural heritage being protected, we have nothing to show people when they come here. We have nothing. A set of rubbled rocks to say that's where it used to be, we need to fix that. And the report, funnily enough, the title is Never Again. So it never again should happen that we are in this situation. And UNDRIP is also the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Again, when I asked that question twice, the ratification of the Convention on Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, I didn't get an answer. I look forward to working with this government, though, in continuing to pursue First Nations cultural heritage and tourism. I in this put country. the question, those are the questions say aye, against no, the ayes have it.